Okay, the time exists a good day. It is the early afternoon of Wednesday, June 5th, 2019. In the beginnings of the lunar cycle, Apistishkitsatos, the flower moon, which is the second of our six summer lunar cycles this year. And I'm down here at Spobikami amidst the trees, a little breeze, rivers right next door. And I'm just seeking a bit of a health break, mental health break. Um, I don't know what it is, but to me, being under the trees and by the water, that combination of things really helps kind of take away some of the stress and anxiety, especially during the kind of like traumatic times that I've been going through recently. And to, to be honest, the last week has been very challenging for me. So I need this now more than ever to be out here. And I don't need to be really thinking about that stuff. <laughs> so I want to talk about work and wildlife um, today because I've got a, uh, some footage that I've captured in the last few, few rounds that I want to share. And, and just um, go through some of my thoughts because an issue has arisen that I knew was going to come about in the form of a baby skunk. You know, this week I, I've had skunk calls every day. No raccoon calls, surprisingly. All skunk calls. And most of them are just to set up traps, but I have moved a couple of skunks as well. Um, two days ago, I got a new client on the west side who has a family of skunks living under a shed in his backyard. And I set up a trap there. First night, it caught nothing. But yesterday afternoon, which was the day after the first night, um, or it might have been kind of early evening, Buddy calls me and says, there's skunks moving in and out of your trap, and the trap's not triggering. So I drove over there to go check the trap, make sure it's functioning and stuff. And when I pulled in, he had a skunk on his lawn, a little baby one. What are you doing out here? You're not wanted here. You're not wanted here. Oh. Little guy, he's so mad, so mad. All right, I'm gonna take him out of here anyway. I'll come, oh, you're spraying me, yeah. you brat. <laughs> um, so I barehanded that one, I picked it up, uh, brought it home with me last night. And this presents a dilemma. There's gonna be four or five more in that hole at this guy's place. I'm gonna be taking him out of there. What do I do with these, with these baby skunks? my whole purpose for being involved in this trapping my whole like other than other than you know i make a little bit of money off of it not really much <laughs> i just make a little bit of uh you know i try to make a living off of the things that i do without going overboard um and being a profiteer so much right but aside from that my real reason for being involved in this kind of trapping institution at all is to try to help the animals. Because what I see is that we're living in an era that was predicted in the origins of the beaver bundle by the beavers themselves. You know, in the, in the origin story of the beaver bundle, in the Blackfoot tradition, there was a negotiation between the animals and the humans. A treaty was being made. And at one point it was proposed, why don't we just eat this human who was, who was uh, kind of at the source of the conflict. The animals were thinking, why don't we just eat him? And old beaver said, let's not do that because yeah, we could It'd be easy enough for us to do that. But if we did that, the human beings, whenever they saw us, they'd be afraid of us. They'd think of us as their enemy. They kill us just for being around. Instead, 
let's teach them the things that we know about how to get our foods, how to get our medicines, how to build our shelters, how to take care of our children, how to protect ourselves from danger. Teach them these things and then they'll have respect for us and they won't just kill us for no reason. But we're living in an era where we're, we're willing to kill wildlife just because they're there, right? Because they've intruded somehow into an area that we've defined as our own um, that doesn't make any natural sense. Wow. Just looking at the river here, we better stop and say something about it. Um, last week when I was taping the, the school groups that came out with me, this was where we were. You know, this, <laughs> this was a rocky shore beyond the willows and then there was a big island out there that they were playing on, right? All of that stuff is underwater. I mean, there's still the really big island, but the water's already up to the willows, which is much higher than it was. Yeah, the river is flooding a bit, not too much, um, but it's flooding and I've seen the dams upstream and I know they're like at maximum capacity. So they're, they're releasing the water and they're trying not to make the flood too drastic, but it might come to that because we're having this big heat wave and the snow up in the mountains is just melting and all of this water is gushing down. I, I kind of feel like we're gonna have a really brutal, 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 dry drought summer here in uh, Southern Alberta. I hope I'm wrong, but it's the way it's looking. Anyway, I have a dilemma when I pick up baby skunks, and that is that I don't have um, somewhere to bring them that is both legal and healthy for them because the legalities of wildlife in Alberta is that um, rehab places will euthanize skunks and raccoons rather than rehab them. And so of course, oh, cool little velvet ant. called a velvet ant but actually a wasp and apparently a very painfully stinging wasp even though I've held them in my hands several times to no ill effect but um yeah in in Alberta the rehabs won't take skunks and, and raccoons if they do they'll they'll euthanize them uh last year I believe there was one person in Crow's Nest Pass at least that I know of who was given a permit to rehab raccoons but otherwise, you know, the options just aren't there. And so I gotta look for alternatives. And what kind of alternatives am I, am I gonna get with my ethics? My, my whole thing is to help this wildlife um, survive their human encounters. And so what it comes down to for me is what's better than death? Because <laughs> most things are, right? Um, so being domesticated quietly in some home uh, where, you know, they're just gonna do their thing and and uh, not make a big scene of it and, and uh, have the government come in and take the animal away. That's an option, better than death. Finding people who are amateur and or underground pro wildlife rehabbers who can get a baby skunk, raise it back into rewilding, that's an option. One of the better ones. Releasing a baby skunk into a family or introducing them I should say into another skunk family with like age mates is a third option. I don't really know what happens in that case. I don't know if they accept or, or, you know, if they refuse, but it's better than death no matter what. And even in the case of 
baby skunks who maybe not survive long term, but they have a little bit of life and they're given, they're given chances, you know, if a skunk lives two weeks, it's better than not living at all for them. For me, you know, if I had to choose, you can die right now or you can die in two weeks, I'm going to choose two weeks, right? So these are the kind of options. And this morning, um, the skunk that I picked up, I found another skunk family to introduce him to. I have a friend who lives on the extreme northwest side of town and under one of his sheds, he has a skunk family. He says they're very animal friendly there. Go ahead and bring him over and um, deposit him at the shed and hopefully he gets along with that family. I don't know. You know, I don't have any tools to monitor it in the long run, but it, like I say, it's uh, it's better than the alternatives. <laughs> so I'm going to keep hitting this. I'm going to keep hitting this uh, this obstacle for the next few weeks where I where I'm picking up baby skunks and I'm trying to find the best option uh, to reposition them in a way that they're going to hopefully survive long term um, their encounter with humans that just don't want them around right so we'll see how that goes rattlesnakes of course are the same way this is the whole thing with the rattlesnake program how can we inter intervene um, because the the cultural norm prior to this program opening up here in Lethbridge was a good snake is a dead snake if you find a snake kill the snake you know Texan style <laughs> yeehaw <laughs> No particular, I don't know, not that there's not an ethics around it, but it's not an ethics that um, values biodiversity, obviously. And so here we have a program to help rescue the snakes from the upset humans. Um, that's not really the city's take on it, of course. The city of Lethbridge is, supports the program as a means of mitigating what is you know, potentially um, a safety issue with the with the residents, which is coming across rattlesnakes in their backyard. They're legally not supposed to deal with them themselves. Um, provincial Fish and Wildlife officers are very few and unable to attend calls to deal with rattlesnakes in people's backyards. <coughs> so a program like this makes a lot of sense. It keeps people legal, keeps people safe, keeps the snake safe, has a conservation, um, has conservation as really a principle upon which the, the program was built, but it's not necessarily the reason that the, that the city's funding it. It's just a, a side benefit, which I'm particularly fond of. <laughs> but um, yeah, so the snakes, same way. And this week I've had several snake calls in the past. Well, while I was gone to the mountains, I guess there was what uh, my friend Dave calls a bull snake lapalooza or something like that. It's just a bull snake palooza. It's just like a big festival of bull snakes. He had several calls um, through the rattlesnake hotline for, for bull snake issues. And even though bull snakes are not um, venomous, the city still allows us to move them. Fish and wildlife still allow us to move them because they know that it's a conservation risk because the humans, if left to their own devices and there's no program, uh, will start swinging sticks and throwing rocks, right? So he moved some bull snakes. I've had a couple of bull snake calls this week. I haven't, I haven't, you know, when I arrive at the scene, there hasn't ever been a snake there, <laughs> which is typically the case with bull snakes. They're on the move. Their strategy, you know, to get out of danger is get on the move. Rattlesnakes is sit absolutely still, hope they don't see you. And if they do, get in a defensive posture. If you can't escape, you know, back out slowly, uh, make your escape. But bull snakes are just, they're gonna get the heck out of there. And if you confront them, they're gonna get mad, you know. They're much more kind of aggressive when confronted. Any case, um, there was some bull snake, there was a wave of bull snake calls. That's typical kind of at the beginning of the season actually. So this may be more like the opening 
uh, of the true snake season. And of course I've been getting rattlesnake calls along with it. Um, probably the most exciting one, well definitely the most exciting one was yesterday's call, which involved a snake, a simultaneous two rattlesnakes at the university. One of them was in the mechanical rooms, again, um, had fallen through the grate at the sixth floor, dropped into the fourth floor again. <laughs> and so I was called in to pick it up. Now this one I took right back to the sixth floor um, hibernacula area because that's what my permit with Fish and Wildlife dictates I do. Uh, while I was there though, I mean up by the hibernacula area, not too far away along a, along a concrete stairwell that, that hugs the side of University Hall, um, there was another rattlesnake, actually two more. They looked to me like both large mature females. One of them I was able to hook and kind of bring away from the stairwell back over to the den site. The other one went into the hole that we observed last week that was being used by the marmot. I guess the marmot has used, has, has moved to a uh, to a culvert pipe somewhere on campus. <laughs> Coming back to the den. Back to the den. But yeah, had a, had a couple of rattlesnake calls. Um, nothing, nothing too much more exciting than that, though. It was cool 
at the University of Lethbridge because one of the calls came from Kai Street, who's still in town, um, who's the, you know the, the the guy who I interviewed last year about about being envenomated. Um, yeah, he's still in town. He's staying in Lethbridge, and he's out in the coolies almost every day, kind of engaging with the wildlife and stuff here. So that's some of the stuff has been going on. Um, and that's just the last three days or so. Another thing that happened yesterday that was really, really uh, a relief to me was that I was offered a, uh, a winter job from late September to mid-March. I'm going to be running another program, um, another Aboriginal employment program coordinating it and uh, this is one that I, I wrote a grant for and kind of had the design in my mind for uh, for the last couple of years and so it's exciting that I'm going to be able to be at the helm of it I'm a little bit surprised because um, the the work with Lethbridge College with the with the programs last winter you know there was a little bit of shaky ground there in terms of morale of the students and um, and I was kind of on their side in in some sense against some of the challenges they were being faced with by the organizations in charge. Um, but I'm glad that that wasn't weighed against me because it, it really is in the client's interest that I, that I was acting. Um, so yeah, I've been offered a, a, a nice full-time position in the season that I would normally be down down and I'm allowed some lenience to to do my trapping still in the morning and stuff that I need to do so I'm happy I'm set basically for the next year um, in terms of work I had the wildlife work this summer and uh, some you know some teaching and field sessions and stuff uh, hiking tours and things and then all winter I'm gonna have that program and then the next summer again wildlife so I'm set for a little while. I can sit back and relax somewhat on the economic side. <laughs> Although right now I'm still very strapped. Um, and, I, and I'm probably going to be strapped throughout the whole thing, but at least I'm going to have some money coming in because I, I was really worried about what to do next winter. I couldn't go another winter, especially with the, with the things going on um, between Mahoney and I. I couldn't go another winter without some decent cash flow so hopefully this will help in that regard um i'm i'm pretty stoked anyway <laughs> yeah it's going to be exciting it's an entrepreneurial program and it's different uh we're we're taking i think about 13 14 clients and these are these are clients that um for for whatever reasons either they have disabilities um or they might be single mothers uh, for whatever ever reason they're not fitting into the normal job market we want to train them in entrepreneurship and help them start a cooperative business together um, that was the original idea anyway I haven't seen I know that there's been some changes that have occurred uh, in the negotiations with the funding organizations but that's kind of the, the premise of the program is uh, is training people who don't have as many options of getting into the job market um, training them to make them entrepreneurs so that they can start their own businesses and you know we can help them do that so that's what I'm going to be involved in all next winter um, and I'm excited about that it's very cool <laughs> like like I say just a, a huge relief I can't say it enough um, something that something that came as a happy surprise in a, in a rough time for me any case I guess that's about it for my update um, I'm gonna take a walk through here yesterday I saw a fawn white-tailed deer so I'm gonna see if I happen to run into that deer again probably not they stay hidden most of the time but I just made one too nervous yesterday it had to get up and and follow its mom um, but yeah hang out here take my mental health break I'll probably edit this video tonight and put it up for you guys and and uh, yeah we'll see 
how the rest of the week treats me. <laughs> I don't know if you can see, but this is the duck nest that I checked out the other day when I was out here with Mahoney and there's a mama duck sitting on it right now yeah she trusts her camouflage so much I could have grabbed her that's how close I was pretty wild. It's good to see she's still surviving. These ducks, they <laughs> they really pull back from the water and they they uh, they nest in unexpected places. This is to avoid the floods, like you see that are happening on the river. Um, but it's also to take advantage of the of the thick brush for camouflage. Just a little end cap. <laughs> Perhaps if I don't get any rattlesnake calls or anything. <laughs> 